Good morning, everyone, and good evening to those joining from Korea. I'm Yan Ho Kim, Associate Director of GW Institute for Korean Studies, or GWIX. Thank you for joining our second North Korea Economic Forum annual conference, co-hosted by GWIX and the KDI School of Public Policy and Management. Uh, today's session on researching North Korea, sources, methods, and pitfalls is the second part of this year's conference. And last week, uh, we had a very successful se session on current development trends in North Korea. And I hope you will enjoy today's, se today's session on a traditional methodology, researching a, a hard target. And we will have the second session on cutting edge, uh, researching a hard target, uh, both of which are uh, addressing the very important topic of methodologies of North Korea studies. And the second session will be uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, let me introduce today's moderator, uh, William Newcomb. Uh, Bill is a, a member and former chair of the North Korea Economic Forum at GWICS. He's a fellow at uh, C4ADS and a member of uh, the, uh, he was, I'm sorry, he is a member of the uh, National Committee on North Korea and he served as a member of UN panel of experts for North Korea from 2009 to 2014. And he retired from the Treasury Department where he was a senior economic advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Bill. Bill. Thank you very much, Yan Ho. Uh, good morning and good evening to our, our friends in Korea. Uh, it's not often you get to say that at the same conference. So, uh, North Korea is one of the few countries that the intelligence community considers a hard target, reflecting the difficulty of collecting reliable information that would assist in understanding developments, capabilities, and intentions. Now, very often you'll see a nightlight image of a dark North Korea surrounded by the sparkle of its neighbors. And that's used to characterize North Korea as a black hole which sort of indicates that nothing is known. Uh, but while North Korea is a hard target, it's not a black hole. And that is exactly what this two-day conference is going to address. Uh, especially since the early 1990s, uh, much has been learned um, and techniques have developed uh, to look at uh, developments in North Korea and better understand them. Now, we're very fortunate that uh, a number of highly skilled, talented individuals have agreed to participate in this conference. Uh, now, uh, I'm only going to provide a very brief introduction so that we save time for the presentation and questions and answers. Condensed biographies are available on the website. Each presenter is going to have 15 minutes and each discussant 10, leaving sufficient time, I hope, for questions and answers. Now, I hope those participating keep their questions on topic. Questions on policy, uh, while sometimes interesting and entertaining, should be left for some other conference. And they won't be uh, further addressed to uh, the panel participants. So the, is Sandra with us, Yano? Yes. Yes, the first session is gonna be on interview techniques uh, presented by Sandra Fai. Um, she's an associate professor of anthropology at Sophia University. And uh, most recently uh, wrote a very interesting book uh, dying for rights, putting North Korea rights uh, abuses on the record. The second session is uh, going to be presented on the use of official economic statistics. Presenters are Stefan Haggard, the Cruz Distinguished Professor, School of Global Strategy at University of California, San Diego. And coincidentally, co-author of a book entitled Hard Targets uh, with Marcus Nolan. And Luya Zhang, who's a PhD candidate
that Ohio State University is co-author of this presentation with Stephanie. Uh, the third is gonna be the eye in the sky using satellite imagery to enhance the understanding of North Korea. The presenter is Jenny Town. She's a fellow at the Stimson Center and deputy director of 38 North, which is well known to all of us who follow North Korea. She's been named one of Worth Magazine's 50 uh, groundbreaking women changing the world and one of Fast Company's most creative people in business for the role in co-founding and managing 38 North. Our discussants are gonna be Barbara Demick. She is uh, a fellow at the New York Public Library Coleman Center and better known to all of us as the author of Nothing to Envy, Ordinary Lives in North Korea. Unfortunately, one of our discussants, Nick Eberstadt, um, who is the Henry Wendt Chair of Political Economy at American Enterprise Institute, is unable to join us this morning. So I'll try to step in in, in his place uh, a little bit in discussing the official data. And the third discussant is Melissa uh, Henneran, Deputy Director of the Open Nuclear Network, One Earth Future Foundation. In 2018, she was awarded the Paul Olam Grant Fund for being one of the most inventive scientific and technical minds working to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. So I think you all agree we have uh, a, a very, very good group. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Sandra. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you everybody for organizing this. Yanho, Minhe, everybody, I am so grateful. And um, it's my honor to be on this panel with such esteemed colleagues. So I'll get right down to business here. So, um, you know, when I began my field work for my study of famine survivor experiences in 2006, I was told by an esteemed scholar of Korean studies that the topic of famine survival and my method for gathering information through interviews with survivors wasn't interesting or valuable. Obviously I ignored this advice and I carried on. And while our senior scholars can give good advice, sometimes it's better for us to trust our guts. Um, and also, perhaps more importantly, it's important for us to read widely. A year later, when I was in the midst of all my interviews, a book came out by a scholar named Miranda Fricker. The book is titled Epistemic Injustice. And by this time, I was deep into my interviews. In that book, Fricker, writing as an analytic philosopher, explains the very phenomenon that shapes our work as North Korean studies scholars. She elaborates how certain types of knowing are deemed more credible or more reliable than other types of knowing. Miranda Fricker elaborates further by identifying something she calls testimonial injustice. And this is where an economy of credibility is calculated and certain methods of knowing are deemed more valuable or worthy than others. After all, how can we trust North Koreans or the method of interviewing as a mode of information gathering when North Koreans are vulnerable, they are poor, they need to get ahead in capitalist South Korea? And how can we trust interviews which are fuzzy and an uncountable measure? So these are the standard questions which people blithely ask about our field. So my first point concerns credibility. A prejudice exists not only about certain types of knowing, but about where or how we gather knowledge. In the words of Miranda Fricker, the economy of credibility applies to methods of research, but also it afflicts members of a certain social group, most notably when the group has historically been, and to some extent remains, unjustly socially subordinate. And so we know North Koreans are subordinate to South Koreans. And this creates a situation where, as Kate Mann elaborates, testimonial, excuse me, testimonial injustice paradigmatically consists in subordinate group members tending to be regarded as less credible, 
when they make claims about certain matters or against certain people, hence being denied the epistemic status of knowers in a way that is explained by their subordinate group membership. Women, the disabled, refugees, migrants, children, and so on, these positionalities are often deemed to be less knowing or unknowing subjects, even on the experiences of their own lives. Sometimes this gets masked as discussion about memory or the passage of time and its burden to memory. Sometimes it gets masked as the remuneration of interviews with defectors. If we pay interviewees, can we really trust what they are saying? In my first book and throughout parts of my second, I discuss using the method of qualitative interviewing as a means to gather valuable information on how individuals experienced life in North Korea. Now, this is the point I wish to clarify. North Koreans are experts at living through the social phenomenon that we study. This brings me to my second point, which is about standpoint epistemology. I was studying the famine of the 1990s. I was the famine expert. My interviewees are experts on having lived through the famine. Let me give an example of how this epistemic distinction manifests in our interactions. After collecting the oral history of Mr. Lee using qualitative inter interview techniques, we went out for lunch. At lunch, I left some food on my plate and Mr. Lee commented on this. You're an expert of famine and you leave food on your plate, he said. Of course, I felt embarrassed and confirmed I was indeed a famine expert and that I was indeed leaving food on my plate. <laughs> I softly said, famine is not about food. Our roles as interviewer and interviewee switched now I was being interviewed. He asked me to elaborate on my claim. Famine is not about the amount of food. It is about who can get food and who can't. He nodded. I elaborated. Not everyone starved. Famine is about power. Kim Jong-il didn't lack for power because he didn't lack, it didn't lack for food because he didn't lack for power. I won't belabor the field of famine studies here, except to say that the most cursory look at the literature shows that there is an abundance of food to feed us all on the planet. Scarcity has never been the issue. Access and equality of access has always been the issue. In other words, who has access to power? But for Mr. Lee, the most salient feature of his experience was indeed the absence of food and the Herculean effort to alter that access. In the immediate, food was the thing he lacked. But in the main, he lacked rights, the right to information, the right to freedom of assembly, the right to free movement, the right to food, the right to freedom of expression. His powerlessness in these areas manifested as an empty stomach. So to return to my point about standpoint epistemology, his inability to parse the structural components of famine does not mean he is an unreliable witness. Rather, his knowledge, rooted as it is in his positioned experience, tells us about famine in situ. His knowledge tells us that the experience so confounds the individual as to make its structural solutions incomprehensible to the majority of people in situ. So to clarify, the issues I'm speaking of here relate to epistemology. To identify which kinds of knowledge our informants have, we must design questions which will pull this out. Interviewees are competent and trustworthy, but it is the task of the researcher to identify the appropriate questions to divine the knowledge. Now, perhaps this is what put off my senior colleague those many years ago. Perhaps he assumed I was going to ask North Korean people to educate me about the famine, rather than asking them about their lives in an effort to get insights into the psychosocial experience of the famine. This brings me to my third point, which is that qualitative interview is not a cross-examination in a court of law. While I was studying how people understood and survived the famine, it would have been disastrous to start by asking about the famine point blank. So this third point pertains to approach. The research, researcher should have a set of questions she hopes to cover. It is important to be flexible and open in steering the interview, seeing it more as a conversation and an oral history. It is best not to lead with pointed difficult questions. Rather than asking, tell me about the famine, I was asking what it was like to live with others, to live with the state during that time. And because I had lived in South Korea for so long, I also knew that it's very important, the hometown, the location. So I was asking North Koreans first to tell me about your hometown. And from there we moved. When did you first notice that things became difficult? 
answers to these questions go some way to explaining the universal phenomenon as to why famines have not led to uprisings or revolutions. Now, because I'm an anthropologist, my approach involves positioning myself in the research too. This means I explained my positionality in terms of the inquiry. I let interviewees know I am an Irish citizen and we were speaking in Korean, so they never asked about my Canadian accent. Um, like Korea, Ireland is a country that was colonized, I explained, and like Korea, we were divided. And over a hundred years ago, we experienced a famine too. This was the position from which my curiosity about how North Koreans experienced famine was framed. It was about me and it was about them. Further on this point of approach, um, interviewees knew that I was collecting oral histories of the famine, but when we sat down to talk, I always asked them about this simple aspect of the hometown, this benign, more comfortable place from which to transition. Now, in the interest of time, let me just quickly move to my last kind of set of key points. Um, I cannot stress enough how critical language is as a resource in North Korea. Many North Korean defectors say that truthful words are more powerful than the nuclear weapons in North Korea. So I encourage those who work with qualitative interview methods to engage, engage the Korean language directly, whether through an interpreter or, if you can, directly. Um, because language is a clever tool for unpacking aspects of life back in North Korea, for uncovering the psychosocial space. Language and its siblings, laughter, crying, and silence, are often useful in interviews for revealing and concealing. So I'm just going to identify kind of six of those things now that people can take away with them. The first one relates to reported speech, and particularly where you have a country which is so censored. He, he said, she said, I heard, they heard. This pertains to how information is gathered and exchanged, how information is corroborated or dismissed. It is also useful to ask about rumors or quote, old wives tales. The second thing is about inner or self-talk and we all do this. How did you think about yourself at that time? How did you speak to yourself about X subject? Uh, this is a means to measure what is the inner world of the informant at the time of the inquiry. A third tool is about humor and wordplay. Uh, I had studied genocide and the Holocaust, and I knew that dark humor was an aspect that shored up the spirit. And so it wasn't unusual for me to ask North Koreans about humor that was common during the famine. Humor can indicate communal agreement. And it's good then you can clarify with your interlocutor, who were these expressions most common among? Only women, for instance, only pertaining to certain occupations or certain parts of the country. Many of you who've read my first book will, and there's some jokes in the second book too, um, that are quite uh, powerful and um, memorable. Four, dreams. These are, are the recurring dreams that interviewees um, struggle with or struggled with when they were back in North Korea. Often I ask North Korean defectors when they dream which country they are in, and often they discuss a kind of blended peninsula. So this is very fascinating and it kind of shakes things up a bit in an interview. Uh, the last two points are about positionality. So asking them about then and there versus here and now. So I often notice you know, people ask North Korean defectors about reunification, but they don't ask North Korean defectors how they understood or interpreted unification when they were back in North Korea. So for instance, they might say, oh, well, life was so difficult, we wanted war to break out. You'll hear a lot of North Korean, even soldiers saying this, we wanted war to break out. And so to ask them when you were there um, and you wanted war to break out, did you want to win the war? Did you want to win it on North Korea's grounds? Or did you want to unify on North Korea's grounds? If you ask these questions to North Koreans, you'll find that they believe, that there's a belief in North Korea, that if they claim the entire peninsula, they'll have the resources of the entire peninsula and they can make North Korea as a unified peninsula wealthy, completely eschewing the fact that democracy <laughs> and uh, uh, you know free elections are things which make South Korea wealthy. Uh, anyway. Um, now, the final thing is that if an interlocutor, if you are encountering doubt when speaking with a North Korean defector, one aspect that you can test what is being said to you is by increasing the cognitive load with your subject. In fact, you can do this with anybody. <laughs> um, ask them to tell the story 
in reverse. And you can gently do this by saying, what happened just prior to that? And can you go back and just tell me, and just a bit prior to that. So you, you inject this temporal aspect and it increases the cognitive load. If somebody is fabricating a story, then it becomes more difficult for them to tell the story um, when that is increased. Now I had some examples of things I wanted to go through, cases where I show kind of cognitive dissonance between um, at the UN COI interviewing North Korean defectors and some other cases, but I see I've kind of gone on for time. So I'll leave it there. And thank you so much for, for listening to that portion of my paper. Oh, thank you very much, Sandra. And that was really interesting. I appreciate it. And I, I really enjoy your keeping you to the, the 15 minutes. That was very close. Excellent. I'd now like to welcome uh, Steph Haggard to talk about uh, official data. Great. Well, th thanks very much. Uh, this is just a terrific conference uh, already. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. And I think starting with Sandra is a reminder of how important it is to, uh, to think about data very expansively and, and not to just limit it to the type of things that Luya and I will be talking about in our paper. So um, let, me, let me start. Uh, next slide, Luya, if you would. <clears throat> thanks. So uh, going from the very kind of uh, humanistic approach that, that, that Sandra has, has taken, we're going to burrow down into some of the more uh, dull pieces of studying North Korea. And what I'm gonna talk about are three different types of official statistics that are out there. Of course, North uh, Korean statistics are not only uh, unreliable, but there just aren't that many of them. I mean, it's basically li uh, limited to the budget and the census. And so when we talk about uh, official statistics dealing with North Korea, we're really talking about two other types of things for the most part, what we call mirror statistics, which are foreign statistics on trade, typically. Um, and by the way, the data on the capital account, that is capital flows with North Korea is quite limited. Um, and those can either come from multilateral sources like the IMF or collated by Korea statistics like COTRA. And my colleague Lu Yaoshang has worked quite extensively in the Korea statistics and in the Chinese customs data, which is one of the reasons I'm collaborating with her. So, so we can look at these mirror statistics coming from these official sources, um, including Chinese customs or the Korean Ministry of Unification. And then the other major source of official uh, statistics is aid data, um, data from the humanitarian agencies which are operating in North Korea, particularly the World Food Program and the FAO. Um, and those provide uh, evidence of uh, need. They, they provide evidence on the extent of aid coming from those multilateral agencies. And they also involve some collaborative data generation with the North Koreans, which is in fact quite interesting. Uh, next slide. So um, uh, there, there are a bunch of things here that are excluded. I, I don't think we need to go through these, uh, but I just make one point. Data on uh, North Korean G GDP or GNP is actually not an official statistic. Uh, the BOK estimates are just that. They're estimates. We're not going to talk about those. And of course, the rest of the conference is devoted to talking about some of these other sources. So let me tell you what um, Lu Ya and I are going to do this morning. Um, we're going to um, try to do two things. We're going to show a bunch of data and how it can be used to uh, make some findings about what's going on in the North Korea economy. We'll look at some trade data in particular. As I said, Lu Ya has worked extensively on this data. Uh, talk about the aggregate trade and its direction, something about the commodity composition, which reveals some very interesting things about what the North Koreans are doing. And then we'll look at some of the aid data. And I'll conclude by talking about what, which of these data, what sources we might see as being more or less reliable. So Lu Ya, why don't you take this uh, portion of the presentation? Um, we firstly look at like the North Korea's aggregate data, as we can see, like and which were which were which was collected from cultural website. As we can see in the graph, uh, after the end of the Cold War, North Korea's trade firstly declined very sharply, and it didn't recover much even after the first several years of like Great Famine. And then after North Korea's repro China and its other like East Asian neighbors, like North Korea like trade finally took off. 
uh, in the first uh, like in the first twenty twenty first centuries, and uh, it seems like sanctions sanctions imposed between two thousand six and two thousand sixteen like two thousand fifteen didn't impact much on North Korea's trade with the world. However, like the sanctions imposed after two thousand sixteen did like has a huge impact on North Korea's total trade with the world. We see like the like sharp decline in both export and import side of North Korea trade with China, like with the world. And also we see like the, uh, oh, sorry. Exports, exports, uh, export, the, the extent of decline in the export side is like the, a little bit lower than the, like it's a little bit, it's much like a greater than the import side decline and which led to like the increasing current account deficit in North Korea trade with the world. And then we look at the trade direction data, which was also collected from Cultra. And the left-hand side graph shows North Korea trade shares with five parties and the rest of the world, while the right-hand side graph show only look at the expert side of the North Korea shares, like trade shares with the five parties and the rest of the world. As we can see like in the left-hand side graph, um, be before the early 2000s, the rest of the world, China, uh, Japan, the South Korea accounts more even shares uh, in North Korea trade with world. However, after the uh, like tightening sanctions in early 2000s, like North Korea have to be more and more dependent on trade with China. As of 2019, China actually accounts for over 95% of North Korea's total trade with the world. And the right-hand side graph, like the, which look at like the export side of the North Korea trade shares with the world, uh, have shows like the almost a similar pattern with like the red, the left-hand side graph. The only striking point here is this increasing as like uh, rest of world export shares in North Korea trade with the world and the, like with the world. As we can see, like from 2017 to 2019, there is almost like the 15 percent of increase of um, the export, export of the rest of the world uh, with North Korea. And some argue, some scholars argue this kind of uh, increase is either due to North Korea, North Korea trade di diversification efforts in order to reduce its uh, de uh, trade dependence on China, or while others argue this is due to like North Korea's um, price competitiveness of this of its export products. And like China Customs provides monthly data on China DPRK trade. This graph shows like the uh, like significant impact of the COVID, the outbreak of the COVID, which led to almost the collapse of the China DPRK trade. Although we also see, see some sign of recovery after the mid after the after the mid 2020. And then we look at uh, like the commodity composition, which was also collected from cultural website. And the left-hand side graph shows the shares of North Korea imported products with Fadis, with Fadis the growth rates in 2019, while the right-hand side graph shows like the shares of North Korea export products with the Fadis growth rates in 2019. And like the both of the two graphs will give us some kind of information about like the structural change happens in North Korea after 2017, after the UN sanctions were tightened and most of North Korea's exports, so like a traditional exports such as coal, seafood, apparel, and the heavy machinery products were banned from the UN sanctions. As we can see in the left hand side graph, the top, the top five, one like, uh, like the top five import products with the fattest growth rate in 2019 includes uh, plastics and man-made fibers and clocks and watches in the part in these parts, and then like the uh, top five exports uh, export products with the fattest growth rates include clocks and watches parts and precision in precision instruments like feathers artificial flower, human hair, toils, and footwears. Like both of the two like graphs combined together, like tell us like, like because we, can, we know like the most of these export products were actually manufactured from like the, like the import products such as plastics and man-made fibers. So like we can see like North Korea is a greater involvement in the global production network and it's like greater independent, greater dependence on export processing activities and and like this kind of uh, 
um, uh, labor la labor intensive industries. And also we know like China, and also we know like China also play a great role in North Korea's this kind of structural change. For instance, like in 2019, um, the exports of the North Korea's clocks and watches parts accounts for over 23% of total export to China. And, and uh, the culture uh, also provides more detailed breakdown of uh, inter-Korean trade. Um, they um, classify the inter-Korean trade into the three different categories, including uh, general trade plus processing on commission trade, economic cooperation, non-commercial trade, and the graph is all about like politics as a progressive party is in power. We see like, um, like, like, gro like uh, slowly grows, like rapid, rapid growth of uh, non-commercial trades. And after the Lee min government took office in 2007, we see like sharp decline um, in North Korea's, uh, like North Korea's imports, like South Korea's exports and no commercial trade not to North Korea. And af after, 2010, the adoption of May 24 measures, uh, the uh, South Korea's trade to North Korea were only restricted to Kaesong industry. And after the shutdown of Kaesong in 2016, the inter-Korean trade were collapsed to almost zero. Yeah, so uh, obviously there's a lot you can do with this trade data, it's, it's quite revealing. Um, the aid data is also interesting, uh, and, and I break it down into three things which this kind of ad, data can do. First of all, they're the estimates of humanitarian need. So the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs issues these reports every year about DPRK Korean needs and priorities, and that's where we find these estimates about the share of the population that are vulnerable and so forth. But then this data is also available to track trends in actual aid through multilateral channels, as well as some very interesting cooperatively generated data, particularly between the WFP and FAO and some of the health and nutrition surveys. So I'll just provide a couple of examples of this. So this, for example, shows something very interesting, which is the general decline in humanitarian assistance to the North, uh, a kind of aid fatigue process that a number of people have commented on, uh, even at well after the famine in the early 2000s, the first half of the 2000s, you still had significant uh, multilateral aid going to the North Koreans and the appeals were, um, were more uh, fully funded. But by around 2006, which is exactly when the first uh, nuclear test takes place, you see this kind of fall off in the willingness of the international community to support North Korea. Uh, let me just um, uh, turn to one other example, a couple of other examples of what I call cooperatively generated data, because North Korea does in fact uh, periodically open itself to collaboration with the humanitarian agencies um, in this rapid food assessment from 2019, for example, you see this quite striking information buried in this table about the shortfall in imports. Um, you know, so when the North Koreans are seeking uh, outside assistance, they tend to be more cooperative. Uh, I have no reason to doubt that this data is correct. And you can see that in 2019, you had the beginning or the onset of this quite substantial shock which continues into 2020. So if we put together all these pieces, the collapse in, in, in trade with China, particularly after COVID, the effects of, of the weather patterns in 2019, these large shortfalls, you can put together a picture of the country being quite uh, seriously constrained. Uh, just a couple more slides. I know we're, we're running up against time. Um, this is an example, again, of what I call cooperatively generated data. Over time, the North Koreans have allowed surveys um, from the humanitarian agencies with respect to things like nutrition. And you can do things like trace over time as these surveys are conducted, uh, the extent of stunting and underweight among North Korean children, of course, very high in the immediate aftermath of the famine and then gradually declining as conditions improve. Note, however, that the last survey here is in 2017 and the irregularity of this kind of data makes it hard to know what's going on 
on a regular basis. So let me just conclude with a few, um, few points. Um, there's some North Korean budget data that we can talk about, but it's, um, it's sort of hard to interpret and Rudy, uh, Rudy Frank has done good work on that. If anyone's interested, I can take that in the Q&A. But let me just conclude by making a few comments about a sort of hierarchy of reliability and validity of this data. So clearly the data which is coming from the advanced industrial states, including South Korea, is likely to be highly accurate. There's no reason to think that the South Koreans would be fudging the data the, of what they're doing with respect to the North. And the data on the activities of the UN organizations is, are, is also likely to be reliable. Data generated in collaboration with the UN organizations, I think is also uh, underappreciated. I, I don't really see any reasons why this data would be considered unreliable, except for one important issue. And that is that the humanitarian agencies don't have access to excluded counties. So it's accurate with respect to the counties that are covered in North Korea, but there are counties which are not covered and that missingness could be significant. The multilateral official statistics like DOTS from the IMF and the data generated by COTRA is um, occasionally vulnerable to missingness and periodic mistakes. In the paper, we track an example for, uh, of, of uh, North Korean exports to Ukraine being confused with South Korean exports to Ukraine. Ukraine shows up as uh, North Korea's largest trading partner. Now, when we turn to the Chinese uh, data or data from countries like Iran, there's a big debate about the veracity of Chinese customs data, but I don't think that's the problem. I don't think the trade data is, is necessarily wrong. The main problem is missingness on other variables of interest like investment, capital flows, and of course, illicit activities. And for that, you need the type of things that Jenny Town and her crew are doing at, at 38 North or C4 ADS. And then on the North Korean data, the budget data we can talk about, um, I, I'm not even sure what it really means. Um, they do report it annually. The census data is probably okay. But the main conclusion we just try to draw on the paper is you need a theory of the case in order to make sense of this data. And you obviously need to use a variety of sources if you're gonna make any sense of it, like the qualitative work, which is done by the panel of experts that Bill was a member of for many years on things like oil smuggling. Uh, thanks everyone for your um, uh, attention and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much. I I was very comprehensive in a brief amount of time. Uh, our third and final presenter this morning is Jenny Town, and she's going to talk about satellite imagery, which, by the way, uh, in the early days, if you were looking at North Korea in an unclassified environment, satellite meant Landsat, and boy, has that changed. Jenny? <laughs> thanks, Bill, and thanks to everyone for inviting me today. Um, I re it's really an honor to be part of this panel and also to see some good friends again. Uh, as previous speakers have indicated, one of the biggest challenges uh, to researching North Korea is finding credible sources of information, hard data especially. And although um, this is one of the biggest appeals of using satellite imagery, it's a source of data it's a source of hard data on North Korea from which data-driven analysis can be done. It's our eyes in the sky, especially when we don't have boots on the ground. And so although uh, high resolution imagery has been around uh, in the commercial space since about 1999, its usage in the field of North Korea studies did not gain wide traction until about 2012. Prior to that, there were limited studies that featured satellite imagery, mainly focused on sites central to North Korea's nuclear program, such as the Yongbyon Nuclear Scientific Research Center and the Punggye-ri Nuclear Test Center test site. This limited usage was due in part to a general lack of imagery. Um, commercial satellite imagery at that point uh, captured North Korea very infrequently in the early years and only of major, major areas of concern. 
In fact, we've recently been doing a historical survey of Yongbyon, and in some years, especially in early 2000s, we found only one or two images of Yongbyon during those years in the public catalogs. Moreover, the cost of licensing commercial satellite imagery made it difficult for some to purchase imagery on a frequent and sustained basis. So fortunately though, as satellite technologies have advanced and the industry has expanded, satellite imagery has become more accessible to the general public, including now more free and lower cost options. Additionally, as public interest has, on North Korea has grown, satellite companies have responded accordingly, collecting more imagery of key sites in North Korea um, at more frequent intervals and making efforts to broaden the areas of the country actually captured as well. So as imagery becomes more available, there are new, obviously numerous applications for this data. The most prominent usage has been to study and monitor what goes on in North Korea's WMD related facilities. These are restricted areas of high strategic value, but where we neither have access to, unless there's an actual nuclear agreement in place, nor does the North Korean government provide pictures of, as they like to do these days with other priority projects and achievements. So while they might show us new tells and missiles on parade, they obviously don't show us pictures of where they're manufactured, assembled, stored, et cetera. The historical, unclassified, and other open source research over the years has enabled the international community to identify several sites associated with the North's WMD programs, for which monitoring activity and change around these sites can give us some insight into what parts of the program are active, when facilities might be expanding or contracting, when testing may be prepared, and other indicators that help us understand how the programs may be developing. Another high profile way to monitor, to use imagery to monitor restricted sites in researching North Korea is the prison camps. For instance, the Committee, on, the Committee for North Korean Human Rights has published a series of reports that combine North Korean defector testimony and satellite imagery to characterize the common physical features of prison camps to make them easier to identify, um, as well as monitor the activity at these camps over time. In these instances, imagery can help us show patterns of life to see if the camps are still active, if and when facilities within the complex are renovated, expanded or closed, and in some cases, even show evidence of forced labor, such as mining activities when the mines are located within the secure camp perimeter. So not only can we get a sense of camp activity levels, but the imagery itself can also serve as documentary evidence in attempts to hold the government accountable for egregious violations of hu international human rights laws and norms. In terms of documenting illegal activities, Satellite imagery is all now also used widely for identifying sanctions violating behavior, such as smuggling, illegal fishing, and exporting of sanctioned goods, such as coal. One of the more recent studies, uh, for instance, published in the Science Advances Journal, set out to assess the scale of illegal fishing by dark fleets operating in North Korean waters. While the problem has been documented to a limited degree in UN Panel of Experts reports, the scale of the problem was largely unknown. Therefore, the study used a combination of daytime optical imagery, synthetic aperture radar imagery, and nighttime optical imagery, combined with other sources such as automatic identification system data, observational data from the South Korean Coast Guard, and other open sources, finding, more, finding that more than 900 Chinese vessels were fishing in North Korean waters in 2017, and still 700 in 2018, despite a ban on the sale of North Korean fishing rights established under UN Security Council resolutions 2371 and 2397, as well as corresponding Chinese laws. This equated to roughly one third the size of China's entire distant water fishing fleet and is now one of the largest, is now the largest known case of illegal fishing perpetrated by vessels originating from one country and operating in another country's waters. Not all satellite imagery studies though are about busting North Korea's illegal behavior, of course. Um, numerous studies have been done looking at things like crop health especially as a result of droughts or floods in North Korea, trying to assess North Korea's food security and identify the scale of North Korea's humanitarian needs. 
Other studies may look at patterns of development. For instance, the prolifer proliferation of markets around the country. Where are they? How big are they? What that means in terms of potential number of stalls um, that that amounts to, and from which then they can estimate the potential taxes or rents collected from these stalls from the markets by the government as a source of revenue. Other studies regarding the economy look more to monitor developments that are reported by North Korean media using satellite imagery as supplementary evidence of what's happening on the ground. Such examples include construction projects like the Wonsan Beach Resort, the Pyongyang General Hospital, the Sunshan Fertilizer Factory, as well as other priority sectors such as mining, power generation, and chemical industries infrastructure. There are obviously numerous ways in which satellite imagery can help advance the understanding of what's happening inside North Korea. But there are also numerous limitations and challenges to interpreting that data in accurate, meaningful, and responsible ways and broad implications for incomplete or overreaching analysis. Pictures, after all, can make for a compelling story, especially on topics where the audience has little prior technical knowledge. In the current 24-hour news and social media environment, news about North Korea spreads lightning fast globally. And once a narrative is out in public, especially with purported photographic evidence, it's impossible to take this back and very difficult to correct. So when it comes to satellite imagery, it's important to keep in mind that satellite imagery may provide a clear aerial view of a specific place at a specific moment in time but it does not provide the context to that image. While analysts are trained to present multiple scenarios with varying degrees of certainty to explain what is being observed, there's also room for varied interpretations and human error. Some key limitations that we deal with when working with satellite imagery is one, limited resolution. Satellite imagery analysis is often more an art than a science, especially when the imagery resolution is insufficient to say for certain what it is we may be viewing. While anything one meter or less is considered high resolution, if you're looking down at a site with even a 0.5 meter resolution, you may be able to see a person, um, but it's a dot. As you can see, these are people in these satellite images. Large boxes, crates may look similar because of their shapes and dimensions. And we often refer to this lovingly as the art of blobology, trying to make sense of blobs based on experience and technical expertise about what should be there, what would make sense to be there, but then also trying to factor in other possibilities if it's truly unclear. Um, another limitation is limited frequency of capture. We often get people who think that 38 North somehow has a live satellite feed of North Korea at all times. I wish, that would be amazing. Um, but of course, we're limited to what is made public by various satellite companies, and which is at their discretion, both on what to capture and also what to make available. So this could mean for us days or even months between getting images of interest. Part of this is also because of weather. While, while there are some types of imagery that can capture through clouds, optical imagery, the majority of what we work off of cannot. And during rainy season in Korea, for instance, this means we can go a month or two without a cloud-free image. So budgets can also be a limitation. And while there are some free options out there now, um, the majority of high resolution imagery comes at a fee, which can limit how much and how often images are purchased, even if they are available. That brings us to a number of challenges as well of working with the imagery. And one of the biggest ones is viewing the imagery in context. For instance, North Korean burial mounds, which is a common cultural practice, have often been misidentified as hardened artillery positions with their similar size and dimensions without that specific contextual cultural knowledge, even a seasoned photo interpreter can end up putting out bad analysis if they don't have this context. Imagery needs to be interpreted in both the cultural and political context of the time. And even then the takeaways can still be murky. Some contextual challenges include establishing baselines. If the coverage is available 
If the coverage available is infrequent, it's difficult to establish patterns of what is normal activity versus something unusual or suspicious. A handful of trucks around the five megawatt reactor at Yangbyon, for instance, are pretty normal to see. But we only know this because we've viewed numerous images over a long period of time to determine that baseline. We don't always have the luxury of sufficient imagery to do so. There's also the curation aspect. Satellite imagery, while being hard data, is not without some level of curation by the North Koreans. There are mobile applications, for instance, that track the location of orbiting satellites, allowing users to estimate when they may be overhead. If the North Koreans are using these or similar tools, they can also plan their more sensitive activities accordingly. This includes potentially refraining from certain revealing activities when satellites are expected to pass overhead, as well as deliberately conducting suspicious looking activities to be captured by the remote sensors. These kinds of caveats need to be factored into the analysis as well and demonstrate that sometimes broader contextual information is useful in determining what is the most likely scenario for what we're seeing, and sometimes it's not. Observation and learning also take place. And so by publishing satellite imagery analysis, it makes the trade craft public as well. There's no selective audience for viewing what's already online. It's great in helping promote broad understanding of what's happening in North Korea, but it means the North Koreans get to learn too. And so we've seen evidence of their learning and adaptations over time, most notably modifications to facilities to increase their ability to conceal what we would look for as indicators of suspicious activities, um, as well as changes in their practices to better avoid detection by satellites. And just a quick example here of some adaptations that we've seen at the Sohei Satellite Launching Station over the years, including now having shelters over the rail spur so we can't see when trains come in um, that used to bring in the, that are used to bring in the stages of rockets when they're about to do a satellite launch. And here on the launch pad as well, they now have on pad facilities um, to be able to assemble and transfer the rocket into the launch tower, um, mainly, mainly, mostly undercover. So good analysis acknowledges and accounts for these various possibilities, providing an appropriate range of explanations with varying degrees of confidence of what's being observed. But these challenges also bring up ethical issues as well. And what are the consequences of bad analysis? What is an acceptable level of tradecraft passed on? Um, and I think it's good that we have Melissa here as one of the speakers as she's been able to, she's been part of an effort to raise these questions about ethical decision-making and principles in the field of satellite imagery. A movement that will only grow in importance as more and more imagery-based studies are conducted among North Korea researchers. And finally, I just wanna point out, while imagery analysts need to strive for objective and responsible analysis, that the media too needs to think more about how they report findings from imagery studies. Responsible analysts work hard to indicate when there is uncertainty, um, when there is uncertainty in their analysis, but that uncertainty doesn't always get reported. Um, and this can also spread bad takes, even if it's based on responsible analysis with imagery that again, purportedly backs it. So the media needs to be much more conscientious about how they report on satellite imagery stories so as not to spread bias, sensationalized or bad information, especially since we're dealing with a lot of sensitive issues of national security concern. And there's a lot more examples uh, in a paper that I wrote for this conference that hopefully people will get a chance to read in the future, but I'm leave it at there and happy to take questions in the Q and A. Oh, thank you very much. And I particularly appreciated the point about taking qualifications into account during reporting. I'd now like to invite Barbara to begin our discussion period. Thank you so much. Um, this has really been fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I don't know um, some of these like upgraded tricks of academics. And so it's been very um, informative to me. Um, I think Sandra's is the paper that I'm supposed to respond to mostly. And um, something that really interests me is, is how much more methodical you are than journalists. Um, you know, when we do the same kind of 
my interviews with defectors, which have been many, have been like sort of sitting in Starbucks and there's usually 10 minutes of like, are we going to have a latte or a cappuccino or pastry? And that's the small talk, but you have a whole method. H- how do you see what you do as different from what journalists do? Barbara, it's so interesting because I remember when your book came out, I had just finished my PhD and I thought, oh, nobody's going to read what I've written because there's this other book that's basically covered the same type of thing. So I don't know. I mean, it could sound bad, but I think what's different from what we do is that most people don't read what we write. (laughs) That's sort of the bad answer. Um, You have have an academic appointment and uh, presumably a salary. So So we can go back on that. That's true. That's true. I mean, I think um, where it's different, I suppose, is in terms of the investment of time and in the investment of um, like the career investment. I mean, I know you just have a new book out as well, I think, this year. Um, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think it's related to Myanmar. Is it correct? Tibet. Tibet. Oh, for me. Okay, Tibet. Tibet. Sorry. So sorry. Um, please forgive me. But, you know, so for an academic to switch so fluidly it would be quite unusual. So the idea is that we not only have the language expertise, but have a deep regional knowledge. I mean, you know, I've been living in Japan for six years and nobody would consider in the academic world, consider me a Japan expert, but in many ways I feel like I am perhaps in in some ways. So I think it's in that way that it's different. Um, And maybe, I mean, yeah, for me, I focus so much on language. So it's a kind of forensic linguistics as well that can be applied that I think is perhaps different from what a journalist has to do, which is to, from my eyes, again, not being a journalist, go in, get the information, mm-hmm. um, consolidate it and make it palatable and make people want to read it and engage it, with it, which which is equally important too. So I don't know. I don't think I've really answered your question, but I believe it. It's fascinating. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to speak more about my experiences because I have so many questions for Sandra. But I mean, what we do is is very similar. I've interviewed dozens, hundreds of defectors. I mean, I can't, I have never really kept, um, kept track and, you know, in a much less methodical way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I did tend to, you know, in my interviews do, you know, as you do get a set list of questions and they vary depending on the person and their comfort level with me. And, um, you know, also their um, exposure to um, journalists and academics. I mean, when I started researching North Korean defectors, it was, um, 2002, 2003. And at that time, it was relatively easy to work in Northeastern China. And um, that was really fantastic because, I mean, I sometimes interviewed people who were out of North Korea for a week. I mean, I remember interviewing some people when we were like sitting in a farmhouse actually looking at North Korea across the river. And it felt like, wow, practically there. And they, um, you know, I felt like the people I interviewed in China, because they were fresher, hadn't sort of constructed, a, pre-constructed a narrative of their experiences. Um, and, you know, once they get to South Korea, um, you know, they've been interviewed by NIS and, you know, usually other journalists and academics and um so their answers are a little bit more pat and I think, you know, not necessarily less honest, but for me, it didn't have that, that immediacy. And as you pointed out, Sandra, we are, we journalists, you know, kind of are in the entertainment business. So we have to have the drama. Um, I also found that, um, the defectors I interviewed, especially the people, um, in China, really didn't understand what I did. Um, they o- always thought I was either a spy or a missionary. Sorry, that's New York in the background. Um, and I had so many times, like, what church were you with? You know, what church, you know, it was in. So if I wasn't with a church, I was a spy. And it was very hard to explain what I did as a journalist. I, I would guess that you had some of the same problems with that as an academic. What you're saying here touches on a kind of cognitive block. 
And that's why I was trying to allude to it with this idea of epistemic injustice. There are certain aspects of life that North Koreans are blocked from understanding by virtue of how controlled information is inside North Korea. So if I had had a chance, I wanted to show some examples of where the United Nations Commission of Inquiry were asking North Korean defectors questions that were questions that were incomprehensible. And even in the answering, the North Koreans revealed that they were, they were, it was, I kind of, I call it a kind of Mobius strip or mm -hmm. kind of Klein bottle, you know, this mm -hmm. object which appears to be multidimensional, but it's actually one dimension. Um, so, you know, the questions about, well, if you didn't agree with Juche ideology, why wouldn't you change your job? This was a question which to us might be cognitively quite lucid, but yeah. for in North Korea, the notion of changing your job is just, it, it, so the question itself was just shut down. And so these things I kind I find quite fascinating. And that's why in my own interviews, I like to ask these unusual questions about dreaming or, or about inner dialogue and reported speech or different things like this as a way to still access um, the information that you know, I mean, there's other examples too, like South Koreans often assume that when they talk to North Koreans about unification, what it's always on, of course, South Korea's understanding of unification. Whereas if you ask them to go back in situ to when they were inside North Korea, how they understood unification, it's wildly different, of course. So these cognitive aspects and these framings I found so fascinating, I would love to talk to you more about this. <laughs> I also used, you know, not as, probably not as organized as you are, but I also used stock questions. Um, and I also found that, that indirectly asking something or asking about something completely different. I mean, the, the question about like at Starbucks, oh, shall we order a pastry? Often, you know, elicited a comment on pastries or the lack thereof in North Korea. Um, I asked people, um, one of the questions I asked, I think I refer to this in my book was like, what are your, some of your happiest memories from North Korea? And that my book, Nothing to Envy is sort of a love story. And the answer to that question, that, that question sort of elicited this whole story about from, from this woman about her, her boyfriend. Um, I was interviewing older people, and it was a while ago. I, I asked people where they were when they found out that Kim Il-sung died. And that was um, that question, like, where were you on 911? Um, was people who had really bad memories, suddenly they knew what they were wearing, they knew what the, they knew the weather, they knew what they had eaten. I mean, it just brought back a flood of memories. Um, somebody, you know, asked about, you know, my own prejudices. Um, I think one prejudice that I had, and it's been a problem in my work, is that interviews tended to go better if I liked the person and if the person liked me. And, you know, since I do books that require um, a lot of reporting, uh, you know, the people in my books, I, I interviewed, you know, 10, 15 times and, you know, hours and hours and hours. So they have to, we have to get along. If we don't get along, they're not going to have, and I, I, I don't pay. So they have to like enjoy spending time with me and vice versa. So that, that is a, um, you know, I think probably in a way, um, you know, taints the, the answers I get. It's, it would be nice. And maybe say on that point, Barbara, um, don't mean to make it too polarize the conversation, but um, I also found that the personality of my interlocutor seemed to reflect somewhat on their own attitude or experience about their ex their life back in North Korea. Some people were just inherently more positive. And of course, yeah. other, you know, people just have their family of origin experience in addition to their town of origin experience, in addition to being in North Korea. So and then, you know, male and female being interviewed, what that's like. And I was much younger at the time and what that was like. And, you know, um, being a white person that speaks Korean, mm -hmm. this type of thing. So, um, yeah. yeah. 
I think you had the um, also had the advantage of um, being Canadian or Irish. I mean, I had yeah. my interviews would um, always start off with, um, can I use a little bad language here? And then, you know, sometimes when I was just traveling around, I think the first thing I learned how to say in Korean was Canada Salameo. No, I'm not. Well, I'm what's interesting too is that I was a foreigner like the North Koreans were a foreigner in South Korea and so that was an, a way for us to connect and so maybe my being Irish Canadian sort of helped in that way that immediately there was no discussion about America we talked about South Koreans as being the other yeah yeah they would say Uri Saram, like us outsiders yeah. I had that I had that um th I had that experience too and I'll just conclude because I know we're running out of time mm -hmm. I, I really loved talking to North Koreans. Um, yeah. And I found, I think because, especially the ones who were living either in China or South Korea, they were outsiders and they felt people didn't pay attention to them and weren't interested in their stories. I mean, people like to talk and they like to talk about themselves. And I also, having just done a book about um, Tibetans, which is very similar, Tibet is not really a very document oriented culture, I found North Koreans very responsive to answering questions. You know, after they got over the shock of talking to an American, I, I just, I couldn't believe how, how they answered the questions and how responsive they were and how articulate even people who were, um, you know, not really well educated. So I, I, I Really enjoyed well, those. They're incredible. They're incredible wordsmiths as well, in terms of the playful expressions that they would use, like the secret police eat secretly, and the um, security police eat securely, and the party workers eat like they're having a party. You know, like North Koreans are incredibly imaginative when it comes to language, just as they are with all the other resources inside the country, because they must. Yeah. I think on that note, uh, we'll move on. Uh, thank you both very much. I love the back and forth of the discussion. It was really very helpful and enlightening. Mm -hmm. So I'm a designated hitter on official data. Mm -hmm. And let me start by uh, talking about what uh, Steph and um, Ms. Young didn't talk about, and that's the Bank of Korea data. And the question or the statement late what, that uh, sometimes countries, uh, particularly advanced countries have good data, it's true, but maybe with some caveats. If you go back to when uh, the Bank of Korea showed North Korea recovering uh, from the arduous march, uh, reporting a 6% leap uh, in, uh, GDP. Well, Steph correctly identified the Bank of Korea data as GNI. That was the first year they moved to a gross national income definition, but they linked it to a GDP base. So uh, perhaps politically, they wanted to show a recovery that if they had kept to the old definition, wouldn't have occurred. Uh, the second point about Bank of Korea data is that it uses South Korean prices to weight North Korean uh, output. So that means you're looking at uh, what North Korea would uh, have produced if it had the resources and structure of South Korean markets uh, rather than a, a North Korean situation. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a strange kind of measure. It's been used in the past, of course, but still quite strange. Uh, on the trade data, uh, a lot of people do use the IMF direction of trade statistics. A caution I would offer is that when you look at it, there's an automatic plus and minus 10% adjustment to take account of uh, FOB CIF. Uh, and it's across the board. It doesn't make any difference if your market is far or near in, in terms of how this adjustment is applied. Now, North Korea trade is so small, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference, but it's a factor that's worth being aware of. Uh, third, um, COTRA. 
Years ago, I thought Kotra data was exceptionally good, but the budget to Kotra got reduced. The personnel assigned to the North Korean trade account within Kotra got reduced at that time in the early 2000s uh, to one person part-time. Uh, I don't know if more resources are now being directed to North Korean trade at Kotra. I haven't uh, been out there for several years. Uh, I would hope so, but Kotra data is spotty. Uh, it omits trade reported by certain countries. It was re missing Brazil at one point. I don't know the, the full list of Kotra uh, trade partners anymore. Uh, perhaps Luya can comment on that in a moment. But I think Kotra, you really have to look at the definitions uh, to make sure that you're getting what you need using that trade data. I've always preferred uh, to take the uh, aggregate UN type trade data uh, and then screen countries where I have pretty good instincts that trade is not going on. Uh, for example, Guatemala reports trade with North Korea. It's really trade with South Korea. It's being misreported by the, by the indexers uh, because in some countries they really have a difficulty distinguishing. I actually saw a bill of lading once uh, that said uh, uh, Pyongyang, Republic of Korea. Uh, so you see the, the complexities of uh, trying to pull together a reliable set of trade statistics. If you do it, uh, and uh, KDI did it, uh, and did a great job of it, but it's about a year's project. Uh, so uh, a lot of us just uh, uh, use some shortcuts when we put together the mirror statistics, but it's the best thing you have going. The commodity trade is really interesting. Commodity trade, if you look at the exports, and North Korea for so many years was a heavy industry country, but they couldn't sell it after the Russians, after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, they, the stuff they sell was poor quality and it could only be, be sold at a very low price point. So looking at what they were able to sell, looking at what they had to buy, gave you a pretty good indication of what was going on in the internal economy. And in fact, let's face it, it's the only window we had. And finally, the last point I want to make is the dependence, the growing dependence, the very, the outsized dependence on China. It's very clear that this is setting North Korea up for a major, well, a potentially major trade shock. Should something happen beyond uh, COVID restrictions? Should something happen in the Northeast provinces of China? Should have something happen politically between North Korea and China? The potential for a severe trade shock far exceeding the one they experienced with the fall of the Soviet Union is, is out there. And it's uh, another vulnerability that the North Koreans are going to have to deal with. I'd like to have Luya talk about culture. Perhaps she can update me on what's going on. I agree with your point, like the uh, culture, like what, like the IM, IMF data, like has, like, no, like when we like try to use the trade data, we generally have to do like the 10% adjustment of F F F I FOB and CIF. And the thing is for the like I IMF data, like in most of cases, they, already, or they have already made the adjustment. In the culture's case, when we, when we, we're making all those graphs, we made like the adjustments on our own. So like, yeah, the graph should not have like problem in that respect. And for like the uh, culture, I think now they have like around like 149 countries, but I'm not sure like, well, like what exactly, what kind of countries they were excluding from their like the data collection pro process. And the one problem with culture is what we found is uh, uh, in 2000, before 2013, like to, before 2014, most of the their like the uh, trade data with respect to like North Korea trade with other countries were collected from like these trade partners directly. So like as we see like in Ch China and DPRK trades trade data, like the cultural data were like cultures reports are almost the similar as like almost the same as like the, what reported by like Chinese customs. But however, after 2014, 
they kind of change their mesh methods. And I see like some like um, almost uh, like 10 or like 5% increase in like cultures like reports on China DPRK trade side, but I'm not, and they like, they, their argument, like culture's argument is uh, uh, they collected data, like e they include the both the information from like China customs and also like from like the international organizations. So I'm not sure like what kind of their, like what kind of, what kind of methods they were using in order to like make that kind of adjustment and why they make that kind of adjustment. I cannot find the information on that, but like if the, like the, for the users to like use the culture data have to be mindful about like the, the trades, like the trades uh, data after 2014 and before 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's- Steph, important. you want to comment too? Yeah, well, I mean, Bill, you've opened you've opened the door on a bunch of questions that, <clears throat> that I think are worth uh, are worth talking about. I mean, let's just start with the BOK data. I, I just think this is overused, frankly, and I hope our good colleagues at BOK, if you're on the call, you know, my apologies. I know you're doing the best you can, but um, in his great book, Unveiling the North Korean Economy, Byung-Yong Kim traces out the whole history of how that BOK data is put together over time. And the reason we don't discuss it is because it's really not, you know, it, it's based on a whole variety of sources which are actually shifting over time, including, interestingly, satellite data, as well as intelligence from the NIS. And some of the key parameters that go into those estimates are actually coming from the NIS. So to me, you know, caveat emptor, I mean, I just, I just don't think this is capturing much of anything, frankly. And the other problem it has, and this is a, a sort of technical point, is that the errors are not constant over time. You know, that's one of the most important points, because as the informal sector, for example, has grown, we all know that that has to account for a larger share of the, of the North Korean economy. But the type of, of, of things that they're monitoring in order to generate those large estimates aren't capturing you know, some portion of that activity. So if you've got, you know, 15% of the economy in the informal sector in year one, and then 40% of the economy in year two, then the errors can just swamp things. And I just think we have to treat that with a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of caution. Now, similarly, you know, the F the, these technical issues about CIF and FOB and adjusting the trade data, you know, that's to me is less of a problem because you still, the trend is gonna be constant with respect to those adjustments, right? So the magnitudes may be off by 10%, but at least you know that starting around 2015, there's been this sharp decline in North Korea's officially reported trade. I mean, there's just no question about it. Now, what we don't know is we don't know this, the magnitude of the illicit trade, which is complementing that. But at least on the officially supported side, we know that it's large. Uh, the fall off is very large. And then the collapse in 2020 is just, is just really striking, right? Now, I this allows me to, to uh, just um, mention a couple of things uh, with respect to the dependence on China. <clears throat> and this is something which I don't think people have fully appreciated. I mean, Jenny's crew would obviously know this. But North Korean exports have fallen off to the rest of the world, meaning mainly to China, have fallen off much more rapidly than Chinese exports to North Korea. But there's an important implication of this that I don't think is fully appreciated. And this is just, you know, International Economics 101. The deficit between the two countries has widened very significantly. And to me, I call this the North Korean mystery of the universe which is what is the source of funding for that deficit? Because we know in an accounting sense, the sources for financing that deficit, there are a limited number of options. It's either FDI, foreign direct investment, it's aid, it's remittances and other service income that are not being tracked, or North Korea is drawing down reserves that they hold somewhere in the world. And this could be in banks in China or Russia or in the Middle East. But the important thing, you know, the important conclusion I draw from this is that while it looks like China has been vigorously, imp imp you know, imposing these sanctions, 
We already know from the panel of experts that there's a lot of leakage on the, on the smuggling side, but I don't think it's appreciated how much support China's continuing to offer North Korea on the capital account side. No. There's money flowing into North Korea from China. There has to be. And it could be arrears that firms are running, Chinese firms, they're just not being paid. It could be aid. But to say that, you know, the, the, the boom has dropped on North Korea is just not completely true. Because as long as I can continue to spend, I can continue to import without, you know, paying for it then China is keeping North Korea afloat. And there's just no question about that. It, to me, in, in my mind, there's never been any question about that. They're not going to let North Korea collapse, right? Um, let me just really, say one really, other thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Briefly. One other thing quickly. And then, yeah, very briefly. The commodity stuff is really worth looking at. I, because I think, and this is, this is entirely Lu Ya's innovation. I mean, she dug into this data and you really see that, that there's adjustment going on there, you know, getting into these new industries. But those happen without Chinese consumers on the other side. And I'm not talking about retail consumers. I'm talking about international production networks that are effectively run by Chinese firms. I mean, I think that's the big implication of Lu Ya's finding on this commodity composition data, that these new international production networks are springing up over the last couple of years, and the Chinese have to be running them because you know it's not North Korea who's marketing these goods. Thank you very much, Stuff. And thank you, Luya. I, I really second his point about how much you can learn from exploiting commodity data. I, I think it's really important. Uh, uh, one last quick comment for those of you who may be interested in North Korean's official data history rather than what's going on currently, uh, a former colleague of mine, Joe Chung, wrote uh, a dissertation and a book on the North Korean economy many years ago that effectively exploits all the existing official data up until the point where they stopped publishing it. And with that, I'd like to turn to Melissa, please, uh, to discuss Jenny's presentation. Thank you very much, William. Uh First of all, I'd really like to thank all the organizers for putting together such an interesting grouping of topics. Uh, even though I find myself much more absorbed with the satellite imagery part of things, I found many crossovers with the other uh, laments and wins in the other discussions, everything from cognitive blocks to um, triangulating data and um, I really actually see a, a strong opportunity for data fusion between satellite imagery and the other fields we discussed today. Um, one of the things I learned as I do satellite imagery analysis myself is that you need to have a great deal of humility and a great deal of um, openness to learning uh, from other people. The field itself is so interdisciplinary because you're literally just looking at pictures of widely different things that you almost always have to consult with someone who is an expert. Just being an expert on looking at the satellite image is never enough to interpret it. You need to know uh, who, someone who worked in that factory or, uh, you know, uh, someone who knows about burial sites, for example. Uh, I think Jenny and I are part of the first wave of satellite imagery analysts that are tr trained entirely outside of an intelligence agency. And uh, that makes us sort of the harbingers of what's to come, uh, hopefully good ones. <laughs> uh, but I think Jenny's really captured some of the benefits and challenges and limitations to open source imagery analysis. And I really commend her for going out on a limb on a lot of topics that are under discussed. And that's part of the lack of, that is partly due because of the lack of diversity in our field. So, um, as Jenny described, the, the cost of satellite imagery and the cost of learning how to interpret it, uh, how to operate the software required to understand it, and the artificial intelligence or other types of um, uh, research that you may want to do on it is still widely dominated by American men, uh, not Koreans, 
uh, and, and not women. And so um, just uh, to echo what she already mentioned, um, you know, we've had a lot of really terrible intelligence misunderstandings because uh, the person was looking at what seemed like uh, an Iraqi attempt to divert nuclear material when originally it was just an Iraqi irrigation system. And if that person had been Iraqi or a farmer, they may have known that. But unfortunately, these, these assets are so tightly kept that they, you don't have the opportunity to share the information. It's so siloed. And especially when you're inside an intelligence agency, you, you can't always get the consultation you need. So one of the fantastic benefits, although it's still moving, is that in open source, you do your work publicly. You show how you did the work and you are challenged <laughs> all the time, as Jenny knows. <laughs> uh, so um, because as she said, it's sometimes an art more than a science and, and we have to look at the blobs. Uh, a blob that looks like one thing to me may look like a different thing to her. And um, part of the uh, work that really goes into making our field rigorous and scientific, much like Sandra described in her own field, requires us to set some standards and some ethical protocols for consulting. And I think that, um, I th especially the section where Jenny talked on the power of an image uh, to rapidly go around the world and tell a story uh, is one of those drivers that, that in some ways gives outsized power to an imagery interpreter. So no offense, Lu Ya, <laughs> but if you show me all those line graphs, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal might not publish them on the front page. But if Jenny has a photo of volleyball players at a nuclear test site, you better believe all the news wires in every language will slap that on a main breaking news story. And I, I, when you put that image up, I almost giggled because after that volleyball story went up, I got calls from three journalists asking me, Melissa, does the fact that the North Koreans are playing volleyball at the Pungiri nuclear test site mean we're going to have a nuclear test soon? And, and I, you know, with a straight face had to say, no, they're bored. They're at a, a, a secure location in literally the middle of nowhere with only one road going in. There's nothing else to do. Sometimes they play soccer. Um, but that, that effect of having an image, uh, like a, almost a CSI, if, if you watch the television show, effect of proof, uh, I think really affects uh, how satellite imagery plays out in the narrative of the world. And um, as, as much as we as analysts try to settle that down, unfortunately, it's almost always the most extreme findings out of our work that gets published. And uh, it's boring to say everything is normal at the Pungiri nuclear test site today. So I do think that education about satellite imagery and its limitations, as Jenny pointed out, is really useful. And, and I hope as it becomes more widely available, as people start looking at it, as they look for their favorite restaurant, that that might be no more normalized. Um, and I also thought Jenny had some good points on the cost of satellite imagery. Um, I think one of the challenges, uh, even between Jenny and I, uh, with the cost of satellite imagery is that you have to be very competitive to earn the grant money to buy it. Uh, it's, very, it's still very expensive. And it means that there are those in the field who can afford the data, and then there are those who cannot. And it's often zero sum, especially with grants towards nuclear weapons research declining more and more each year. Um, so while this type of interdisciplinary research should really be done collaboratively, it's often done competitively and secretively because you wanna be first or you want to break, you, know, you wanna break the story first or you want to have the most impactful outcome and so on. Um, so I do think uh, as, as Jenny touched on, there's some like 
big structural changes that could happen. Uh, but my, my final takeaway is really like fantastic job, Jenny, uh, really impressed with what you're doing. Um, and, uh, I would, I would actually ask all the panelists to collaborate on something together, because just as we were talking about commodity data, um, you know, Jenny can pull agricultural data. She's been already been tracking coal piles. And as she mentioned, the optical and radar data and AIS ship data, as well as now radio emitters. Um, all of that data can can be triangulated, as Stephen said, to confirm uh, or um, not confirm what you're seeing in other areas, what's being reported elsewhere. And I think that makes things really um, much more tight. Um, and, and I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you very much, Melissa. And what I also took away from your really insightful comments is how much what you said can be applied to other lines of inquiry besides satellite. Uh, particularly the point about you know, cooperative work. Uh, when we uh, build task forces, for example, uh, to bring different expertise together, uh, it, re it really yields much, much more robust results. Uh, with that, uh, we conclude the uh, presentation discussion section. We've now gone to Q&A. I will uh, read the questions that I received from Q&A, and then uh, I'll, I'll direct them appropriately. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, take them in the order received. The first question is from Andrew Yo. Hello, Andrew. Nice to have you with us. It's for Jenny. Is satellite imagery analysis primarily conducted by humans or is artificial intelligence playing an increasing role in detecting changes or unusual slash interesting patterns? Thanks, Bill. And thanks, Andrew. It's good to hear from you <laughs> wherever you are in the world right now. Um, in terms of satellite imagery, there is a lot of uh, AI being used now for change detection and it's good for change detection, um, but you still need a certain level of human in, human intelligence in this um, to make sense of what those changes are and if they are significant or not. Because you know, it's one thing just to say that something has moved or there's a new construction or there's new buildings or you know that these slight changes have happened. That's fine to have a machine try and assess that, but again, it doesn't understand context. It doesn't understand what should be there, um, and you know because this is more art than science. Uh, a lot of times, you just don't even you just don't know until you look at it what it could be. Um, in the paper that I wrote, there's one example that we have of when we were um, watching the Sohe Satellite Launching Station, when they first started building those um, d big domed buildings that became the NADA Administration Center on site, um, it started out as a flat disc, which looked like it could be a launch pad. And, and then it was this circular foundation with these partitions. We had no idea. I think one of the theories was it was, you know, an alien construction at some point, because it was just so out of context, so out of place. We just had no idea what they might be doing with this. Um, as they started to build it up, um, some other theories were that it could be an amphitheater because of the, the way it was structured. And someone else had even suggested that maybe it was some new type of, of launch pad, something similar to what they had at the Tonghe um, satellite launching station with a big hole in the middle. So it wasn't until they got to the end part um, where they did start to put the dome over it that they really understood like, oh, this is a building. And then once they saw that, um, then they could compare it to, for instance, it, it looked similar in structure to the, um, the uh, main satellite control building in Pyongyang. Um, but until they got the dome on it, it was just really so out of context that, you know, change detection could have picked it up that there was something going on, but it certainly couldn't tell you what or of what significance it was to the program. So, you know, you still need that human touch to interpret um, once those changes are detected, what's happening. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, the ne next two questions come from Bill Brown, and I'm going to uh, flip the order that he asked though, uh, since Jenny is still on screen. Uh, Bill asked Jenny, 
Uh, does the U.S. government restrict your ability to report on certain sites? Do you think this is fair? We have not run into that. Um, you know, we, we work completely in open sources. We don't have any classified, uh, we don't have any um, people with uh, clearance. Um, so everything that we do is based on open sources. We have not had any interventions from any government saying, don't do this. Um, one of the things that we have experienced in the past though, especially when there were fewer satellite imagery companies was, you know, there were instances where the government would buy out images so that they wouldn't get put into the public catalog. And in those instances, then it really restricted our ability to, to monitor on a sustained basis. So, you know, there are ways that interventions can happen, but, um, you know, sometimes, it, yeah, so far we haven't run into those kinds of problems. On that subject too, there's no, just as Jenny said, there's no restriction, but I have a strong desire to buy not only American satellite data, and I tried to buy CoreSat data, and uh, everywhere I want to look, they can't sell. So uh, there, you know, it's not a necessarily a government section. It, uh, situation of censorship, but uh, Korea also has regulations about where you're allowed to buy satellite imagery. So even though they're collecting it, they won't sell it to someone like me. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Bill is going to be directed to Steph and Luya. Uh, but if anyone else has a comment, please uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, his question is, does anyone carefully report in Korean or in English small pieces of data that may be published in the North Korean media? For instance, a percent change in fertilizer production in Hamhan. When China was a similar data black hole, local media actually published a lot of useful data, but it took great effort to put it together. Lu Yan, do you, do you have any, I don't recall ever seeing anyone mine those sources yet, but in terms of tools, I would just, um, you know, point out that text analytics, you know, is coming down the pike too. And in, in future things, it's possible that this could be a kind of source. I mean, Lu Ya has done work you know, doing things like scraping official statements with respect to peace regimes and peace agreement language and things like that. So that could in principle be done. I guess my gut instinct is it's boy, pretty fragmentary, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't have like that more comment on that. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I should just, I should just uh, shout out because this, you know, community is so great. Uh, Bill Brown himself has done, you know, tremendous analysis on this whole issue of the current account deficit and how it's financed. So. If anyone wants further views of this, his work at KEI, and I think he's put things up on 38 North as well, is really worth taking a look at. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Luya. Uh, the next question is from Mark Tokola. We haven't discussed the North Korean infrastructure. Are we able to see how well rail and road trafficking is, is doing? Can we gauge power generation and distribution? Uh, I want to open that up to uh, to Jenny first, and then Steph and Luya, if you want to jump in, you're welcome. Thanks. Um, it's a good question. Infrastructure is hard. Um, again, you know, we, we don't necessarily have consistent imagery over time, and we don't necessarily have full imagery, full um, country coverage. Uh, at the level of resolution you would need to be able to really assess um, road conditions, for instance, or bridge conditions. Um, this is a question that does come up a lot. And certainly there have been improvements in new roads that have been built, new highways that have been built, um, and uh, new train stations that have gone up, especially you know, leading out towards Sam Dion area and some of the newer sites of interest to the, the current Kim Jong-un regime. Um, but, you know, it doesn't tell you how good of a road it is. <laughs> and certainly the, the stories from like humanitarian workers and other people who have been in country can tell you that the, you know, the road conditions, even if it is newly paved, doesn't stay smooth very long. Um, and it doesn't uh, necessarily make it an easier ride. 
Um, but yeah, there are definitely, you know, constant infrastructure improvements going on. There's constantly efforts to increase the um, power generation. There's a lot of new power plants that have been in construction over the past 10 years. Um, some of which, you know, have come online in the last couple of years. Um, and there's a lot of diversion of uh, power generation from certain areas to others uh, that we know not necessarily because of satellite imagery, but because of, again, anecdotal stories um, coming from North Korea. So, you know, power generation itself, we can tell if a power plant is running there's usually some signatures and indicators if a power plant is operating or if it's still under construction um, or if it's being repaired. Uh, but we can't tell from the imagery the level of, you know, if it is operating, what, at what level it's operating and what its output um, is really in, in real life. We have seen, for instance, though, a proliferation of, of solar panels around the country. Um, especially in the countryside on buildings and stuff. So, you know, it isn't just the big power plants, but there is obviously a big push for energy um, and power generation throughout the country uh, that, you know, some of the bigger power plants haven't been able to meet as of yet. Yeah, I have a brief comment on this question. And I think like uh, you can use a Google a Google Earth engine, like code editor to class like night light, night light images like the Google Earth code editor, they provide, I guess, like from uh, early 2000 to now, like the like annual data on like North Korea's no, like night, night light images. And if we um, use that data, we can actually calculate the, we can actually draw the graph of like the uh, trends of North Korea's land, like the urban buildups. Like I did a research on that one. And, but the problem with the, the night light imagery is the, uh, um, I, I think they, they have like the radar adjustment in around 2013. And like, um, like if you want to compare like the trend before 2013 and after 2013, you have to make very like complicated technical adjustment on that one. But, and the thing is because they like a low resolution, I cannot like a specific, I cannot like identify which location had what kind of build ups. I can only like get a sense of like the uh, total size of the build ups across the countries and yeah like that you know again this shows you how this this idea of tri triangulation I, I can't remember if there's a panel on on the nightlight data but there's you know there has been some interesting work going on on that but with respect to infrastructure um, you know this is another example where it's probable that there's some foreign direct uh, investment component here um, which you know we're just to you know totally unable to capture. So we did look at the UNTAD estimates of foreign direct investment into North Korea, and they show it as being dropping down to net zero in recent years. But that's just a, nothing but a guesstimate, and is almost certainly wrong. And so the kind of things again, which we can't capture well, is just think of of Chinese investment in the bridge. You know how much is that? What was that worth? Um, you know, that's a transfer to North Korea, in effect. Um, but where does that show up? It shows up in that black hole, you know, current account deficit. You know, we just don't, we just don't know. The other thing is that there has been some um, press accounting, and I think uh, Lu Yaz looked at this, you know, speculation that there's actually private Chinese foreign direct investment into uh, North Korea. Now, not in infrastructure, but quite possibly in real estate markets, for example. Uh, and so some of the construction you're seeing more generally could be foreign financed, at least in part. Thank you, Steph. Uh, I would like to do a tangent on that question uh, directed to Sandra and Barbara. Uh, if you were interviewing defectors on dealing with infrastructure problems, electricity shortages, uh, and how that affected them. Uh, there was always, at least I've noticed, a reluctance to generalize countrywide from the experience of a geographically uh, selective uh, draw of defectors. Uh, and so their answers tend to be discounted as not necessarily representative of the whole country. And that argument actually was used for years uh, to avoid uh, interviewing defectors until uh, Steph and, and Marcus uh, used interview techniques to get at some of these broader issues. 
So how would you respond to uh, geographic concentration being a problem? I, I, I guess I can start on that one. The, I mean, I've tended to work with um, microcosms. I'll use one place at a time. And um, so, I mean, my, my work in Nothing to Envy was on the city of Chongjin and the, um, you know, I, I mean, I find that that type of reporting, it kind of, it makes me angry when people sort of dismiss defector accounts because, um, you know, there's a ways of interviewing and, you know, Sandra talked about how to make it more methodical, but when you interview 10 people from the same place and you interview them separately, it's like the same standard as in a courtroom, you'd have the prosecutor would say, okay, 10 people saw this, you know, at this time and they're interviewed separately. So, you know, it's happening. Um, but it, it's true. I found things um, when I interviewed defectors from um, different parts of the country, it was very um, variable. And, you know, I would say the only um, help for that would be do, do more interviews. Bill, I'll just quickly add something. Thank you for that question. I appreciate you trying to loop us back in there because sometimes when you do qualitative interview work, it can sort of seem unwieldy to these other um, topics. But, you know, I love the work that um, staff and Li Ye and Jenny are doing and Melissa. And, you know, if I could have the funds and the research, I. Uh, the research funds, I would love to do work with more defectors, particularly in areas of their occupations, and to focus specifically on particular types of work, and to do interviews related to their work, then I think you would be able to get greater insights in terms of infrastructure. If South Korea were to open this up to all of us, I think um, we could do so much more, including on the topics that I find a little bit more interesting, like humor and the psychosocial space. But um, yeah, I mean, teachers, if we could do more work with teachers, doctors, train drivers, um, subway drivers, you know, all these types of things. I, I think that that would be how I would include that work. First of all, there's just no way you can understand this data, you know, in its totality without including the kind of things that Sandra and Barbara are doing with these other sources. I mean, look at the prison camp work, for example. You know, that's benefited tremendously from the combination of satellite imagery with defector testimony about the camps. And so thinking that these things can be done in isolation. But with respect to the particular question about overrepresentation, um, you know, it's this question of, of uh, North and South Hamung, you know, kind of dominating the, the, the defector space. And, and there are, you know, econometric techniques, simple ones where you can kind of control for where defectors are coming from. And, um, you know, there, there, there are differences, you know, because those areas were obviously hit harder. That was part of Barbara's book. And Sandra has made this point as well, you know, the, the neglected side of the country. Um, so you can, you know, if you're doing larger samples, you can, and smaller ones where you've got people from different areas, you can kind of compare you know, what the experiences are from different regions and see how they were differentially affected by things like the famine. Thank you, Steph. Uh, I want to pass along a comment from Bill Brown. I presume he didn't say this, but I think he's referring to the difference in culture data uh, reported for China from official Chinese customs statistics. And he says they probably add Chinese crude oil exports, which are not included in customs data. Uh, now I'm going to move on. We have a question from Marcus Scarlucas. Um, Melissa, as Bill zeroed in on, great explanation of some of the dynamics that can be obstacles to wider collaborative, cooperative uh, analysis. I encountered similar but not identical challenges in trying to integrate analysis across the various US intelligence agencies in my former role as national intelligence officer but I at least had some authorities, resources, and tools that I could leverage to overcome these problems and promote positive change. Could you speak more to this issue as it applies to analysis outside the US government and offer to overcome these obstacles in the non-government analytic community? 
there is just nascent work happening on this. Jenny mentioned that uh, a lot of the uh, research uh, think tanks and uh, organizations related to open source met in Boulder, Colorado to start talking about these issues. Um, I think that there's a few people who have crossed over like Frank Pabian who used to do uh, classified research and, and now does open source research and so on. But I don't actually have a view of what it's like to be in a classified environment. Um, I think that uh, if, if the question is about budget and, and assets, then I think in addition to funding those who may not already have the ability to fund satellite imagery analysis, you know, our inter interlocutor there are the foundations, the private foundations themselves, as well as government found, you know, government grants. Um, those are the people who have the most power over an NGO because uh, they can always stop funding you. So if they build ethical or collaborative mechanisms into the work, then it will be done. But I'm not sure, I mean, I'm speaking I'm speaking from a really wonderful position right now. I'm, I'm in a foundation. So it's, it's, an, it's not the kind that gives grants, but for the first time in my life, I'm not fighting for a grant. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think foundations themselves are still learning about satellite imagery. Um, so for example, I, I never told Jenny this, but um, I did speak to several foundations to try to see if we could put together a consortium bid on satellite imagery from various companies and then provide it to lots of groups. Um, but the feedback was, well, we only have a few people who are really using it. So it's more cost effective for us to just give it to them. And um, that's not like a growth mentality, really. Uh, it's, it means that those who already have the grants will, will continue to be the ones who use them. Um, in terms of uh, maybe differences of opinion, our referee is Twitter or the internet. And uh, there are some hot and heavy fights out there, particularly on Iran and uh, occasionally on North Korea as well. So um, because some of the visual interpretation is quite subjective, uh, it can be interpreted multiple ways. Uh, there are, however, you know, a lot of things we can do to triangulate the answer and so on. But right now it's an online brawl. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I've answered the question well, but feel free to follow up later. Oh, thank you, Melissa. I thought you, you said about as much as you could. Um, yeah, I agree with Melissa, and it's good that she brought up that issue. It, it, it is an environment now where it's hard to collaborate uh, because we are competitive, um, and especially competitive for funding. So I think, you know, it really takes a culture change to be able to do this. And, and the, the meeting that Melissa referred to in Boulder, um, which this report that I, I talked about in terms of the gray spectrum um, and ethical decision-making, uh, I think was one of those efforts led by Melissa um, to help try and create opportunities and create a, a purpose for and, and an opening for greater cooperation and collaboration, at least peer review. Um, we always make sure with satellite, at 38 North that our satellite images are reviewed by two or three analysts before they're published to try and get, you know, different takes on it, especially since it is, again, a lot of times blobology. What does this blob mean? What does that blob mean? And they don't, our analysts don't always agree, which is good and gives us a range of, of options to then list as to what it is we're seeing. Um, but to collaborate across you know, other organizations as well would also be useful, um, but it, it, it takes a concerted decision on our parts and all of our organizations to be able to work together in that fashion. Um, one way that uh, the, the classified community and the, um, the open source community have started collaborating is through um, NGA's Tearline platform. So we've been working with NGA um, they, you know, working to identify different areas of interest, topics of interest and analytical questions um, that they help us then also provide imagery for, for us to work off of to, to 
um, to answer these analytical questions or try and provide some insights into these analytical questions. And so it's a kind of public private partnership. And so I think a lot more of those kinds of ventures will pop up in the next few years as well, as well as, like I said, there's more free options. And so planet imagery has been really useful in helping broaden the field of people who have access to imagery. And while it's not the highest resolution, it oftentimes is useful um, you know, for identifying kind of larger areas and, and larger things that don't need such granular detail, but has helped open up the field and help create opportunities to collaborate and cooperate as well. Thank you, Jenny. I, I really love the term blobology. When I was on the panel, we depended upon the expert expertise of uh, what we call cratologists who would measure crates uh, and say, well, this is the same dimensions as uh, AK-47s that get shipped in or something of that sort. Anyway, I, I love the new term. Uh, the next question is from, I believe, a student. And so I'm really pleased to see that we got students participating. Uh, thank you for interesting presentation. I'm Jean Yu Choi from, profess from Professor Emmanuel Kim's Korean class and have a question. Is there any North Korean government program for those who financially need help? For instance, the US began temporary assistance for needy families uh, to assist indigent American families. Uh, I'm not aware of one, but if anyone is, would you please jump in? I guess the answer to that one is no, there's not. Uh, but obviously one would be really needed. Uh, the next question is from Jean He Jolie and it's directed to Sandra. It used to be Soren, I presume that's Chosen Soren, and some of its Zanichi community that used to have some of the latest and fastest info on changes in daily life in North Korea for a long while until Japan turned so vigilant toward Korea since the late Abe administration. What continuing changes or lack thereof do you see in terms of Japan's access to North Korean info? Thank you. This is a great question. Hi, Ginny, good to see you. Well, not see you, but good to have you here. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. The I think Japan is sort of hindering itself by not permitting more returnees, uh, more North Koreans who had gone into North Korea from Japan to come back and resettle here. They've kind of tapped out at, I think, about 200. Tessa Moore Suzuki has done a lot of work on this. Um, and I mean, with the new um, prime minister, maybe things will be a bit different, but, um, you know, I mean, um, Asia Press has possibly some of the best information uh, on like a uh, guerrilla journalism coming out of North Korea, which is of course freely available to everybody. But uh, I think probably most of the best information is coming out with um, the latest defectors who are coming out from North Korea. And as we can see, South Korea is kind of really experienced a shortage of those this year because of COVID and other crackdowns obviously related to COVID and Japan has just sort of um, made it very difficult for itself as well just by not taking the defectors. So we'll have to see over the next couple of years how this goes. Sandra, uh, Bill Brown just came in with a late question and we're gonna be wrapping this up very soon. Uh, he asked, Sandra, I use Asia Press a lot for price data. How good do you think it is? So for me, for price data stuff, this is not really my expertise. So I'll leave that to people like Steph Haggard and uh, Li Yang, Li Ya, sorry, I'm, no, I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but uh, I find Asia Press to be incredibly powerful and offers some of the best insights. I mean, um, Bill's question is very valuable. And I think what we need to do is begin pushing that information back into North Korea as we do with the pricing. But I think other types of, um, guerrilla journalism needs to be copied and sent back into, into North Korea. Thank you. Uh, there is a comment uh, from James Park. He said, wonderful North Korea masterclass. And I really have to agree. I wanna thank all of you so much for agreeing to participate. I, I think this has been a really dynamic session. I'm gonna be turning this over to Yano in just a second. 
but I want to encourage everyone, if you're able, stay tuned. Come in tomorrow. My good friend John Park is going to be moderating a session on some really interesting techniques uh, that are also used to investigate what's going on in North Korea. And again, thank you all very much. And in particular, I want to thank the audience that uh, stayed with us uh, through these two hours. Everybody, as Bill said, stay tuned for tomorrow's session. Really great session today, but uh, I, I hope everybody will join us tomorrow also. Thank you. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.